This is Our Voices. I'm Mario Trimble. In order to be a place where everyone in our community feels valued and connected, we first have to ensure everyone believes they belong. These are Our Voices, a joint podcast production from the Colorado and Denver Bar Associations, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusivity Joint Steering Committee. Our Voices shines a light on the unique stories, experiences, and backgrounds of our member leaders so that we can help each other walk together. Samantha Jones Rogers is a staff attorney with the Colorado Association of School Boards. Her interest in the law, and particularly its impact on education, was sparked by her time as a college admissions officer during the time of Fisher v. Texas, the Supreme Court case applying the strict scrutiny standard of review to the consideration of race in college admissions. A self-described Air Force brat, Sam's early experiences as a child of a U.S. service member helped ground her and provide a solid foundation for the development of her character as a person, lawyer, and leader. Our own Linda Moss and Mallory Revel got to talk with Samantha Jones Rogers about her life and the factors that led her to a career in advocacy and education policy, helping ensure meaningful access to education for students across the state of Colorado. Hello and welcome to Our Voices. I'm Linda Moss. I'm a family law attorney with Coombe Curry Rich and Jarvis. I'm here with my co-host Mallory Revel, who's a criminal attorney with Foster Graham, Milstein, and Kalisher. And today we're here with Samantha Jones Rogers of the Colorado Association of School Boards. Hi, Sam. Hi. How are you today? I'm hanging in there. I'm doing all right. Thank you. Excellent. So let's get right into it. Um, so tell us about who you were growing up, what was growing up like for you? Absolutely. Uh, So for me growing up, I was a military brat. My dad was in the Air Force. And so I actually grew up abroad. Uh, My family, we spent four and a half years in Germany and then two and a half years in Turkey. How old were you? Uh, This is so Germany. I was age four until I was about nine and then Turkey Mm. from nine to 12. Oh, wow. So a good part of your childhood. Yes. (laughs) Awesome. What was that like? You know, it was an incredible experience uh, living in both countries. Um, My parents, even though my dad was in the military, again, he's in the Air Force, uh, we never lived on base. And he always insisted that, you know, we live kind of, quote, on the economy. And Mm -hmm. so his thinking was that, you know, we have this amazing opportunity, you know, living in a foreign country. Why, you know, let's not isolate ourselves or insulate ourselves by living on base with, you know, with all the, with other Americans, let's really put ourselves out there and try to integrate in the culture of the, of our host country. Mm -hmm. Uh, So in Germany, we actually lived in a small town called Eder Oberstein, where to my memory, we were the only Americans. Mm -hmm. Um, All of our immediate neighbors were German. So I had a lot of exposure to German culture as well as the German language. And it was just absolutely, it, it was incredible. Uh, And then in Turkey, we lived about an hour away from the base and the city center in a neighborhood that was actually fairly mixed, culturally speaking. Most Mm -hmm. of our neighbors were Turkish, uh, but there were also some American families and some Canadian families living there as well. Did you you speak German? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, a a little bit. So (laughs) we were in Germany for, I was four to nine. So like the first, you know, the the vocabulary that I still have, um, that I still carry with me, it's very rudimentary. It's like kind of a kindergarten level. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, but I actually have been, I, I've made it a practice this year, actually, with, with COVID and the free mm-hmm. time that it's, it's granted me um, to get on some language learning apps to brush up on my German. So it is much better. Awesome. Um, now so yes <laughs> you mentioned you didn't live on base did you go to any base schools or did you go to schools in the community were you homeschooled what was schooling like so when we were in germany uh i attended department of defense dog schools uh one of them was at one of the schools i think for kindergarten through second grade was actually on a base um, the school I attended in Germany for third grade was a Department of Defense, a Dodd school, um, but it was not on a base. It was kind of base adjacent. Um, but I did go to the U.S. Um, State Department, Department of Defense, Dodd schools in Germany. Um, and they were, I had a great experience, actually, with the, the Dodd school system. Um, one, I think that was when I look back, that was the most diverse educational setting um, that, that I had attended. I attended, um, when we returned to the States, I attended mostly predominantly white institutions, pretty Mm -hmm. much from high school on. 
uh, and in Turkey, I also attended, there was really just the one, um, in, we were stationed in Izmir, the Izmir American School, that was a huge building, very tall, it was kind of um, wayside, uh, reminiscent from wayside stories from wayside high, um, where all of the grades, K through 12, were actually in one building, just on different floors, um, but I was homeschooled for our last year in Turkey. So I've kind of got a mixed background in terms of my educational experience. What were the other kids like that you went to school with? Or I guess, who were you going to school with? So with the Dodd schools, mostly other, other American students, other uh, dependents, other military brats. Mm. Um, there were some, also some students, some NATO students coming from NATO families. Wow. That was, it was pretty, I guess it was very mixed. It was very diverse population um of students and i think that experience of just kind of being in that educational setting where most of my teachers most of my peers were diverse most of my teachers were also very diverse mm -hmm. um so i know like i have had i didn't directly have um african-american or black american teachers in elementary school they were taught the upper school they um so my sis they were my sister my older sister's teachers they taught the um the upper the upper grades, um, but they were very visible to me. I had my third grade teacher was a male, something that when I returned to the States, I realized maybe wasn't as, as common, at least not for the elementary school level, um, yeah. to have a, a male teacher. Um, and, so, and with our foreign language teachers, we also have like a lot of diversity there. Like, we were actually taught by a German national um, for, our, for our German classes and the same for our Turkish learning language learning classes. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean the other the other students that I, I went to school with, they're mostly all we were mostly all from military family backgrounds. Awesome. Um, so you mentioned that your dad wanted you to live in the community. Was it difficult at all for you as a young person coming from the United States to integrate into a German community and then a Turkish community? So, no, not at all. I was, I think I was, I was so, I was young enough when we moved to Germany that I really didn't have any memory of living in the States. Mm. Um, you know, I, I was, you know, I was born in the States um, and my, we were stationed in Colorado Springs for, for a little while before we moved to Germany, but I have no memory of that. My earliest memories are actually from, uh, from growing up in Germany. Mm. And so I definitely, that was all I knew um, being abroad. And then when we moved to Turkey, it was, it was different. It was definitely a, a culture shock having come from, from Germany. Um, but the military, one, they do a great job at helping to integrate families that move and that with their transitions. That's a pretty integral part of being in the military and being in that life. You know, you're going to move around a lot. And so mm -hmm. we have host families uh, in each country that help us get integrated. And then we were very lucky that all of our neighbors, um, both in Germany and in, in Turkey, were just very welcoming. Uh, mm -hmm. very friendly it, it really felt just it felt like a smooth transition stepping into you know these different worlds these different countries mm -hmm. that's and, very cool I was yeah. also an air force brat and we we lived on some bases and other times we didn't live on base but we get kind of used to the cookie cutter houses and <laughs> everyone is very very similar you know at least occupation you know everyone's parent has at least one of the parents has the same job and um, you know, everyone's kind of the same socioeconomic background because they have the same jobs and it's it's just very cookie cutter almost. So it's so interesting that you got to live not only abroad, but off base abroad. That's <laughs> that's awesome. So you said that you felt that your um, your classmates and even your teachers at the schools were very diverse. Was that the same experience that you had off base or out of school, I guess, since not all of your schooling was on base. Right. So dear, do you mean um, just sort of like after when I come, when I went home after school was like the neighborhood diverse? Yeah. Did you see racial diversity in your neighborhoods? Any other type of diversity that, you know, stood out to you as a kid? So racial diversity? No, not so much. Um, again, living in, in Idar Oberstein in, in Germany, it was, we were centered mostly by, by Germans. There were a few other, um, like mixed uh, biracial German American families, or at least there's one mm -hmm. that I can remember, um, mixed race German American uh, biracial family that lived up the hill from us. Um, but racially speaking, that was about that was about it. We were the only Black American family 
mm -hmm. um, in our neighborhood, on our street, in, in, on Ringelbachstrasse in, in Ider Oberstein, and in uh, Izmir in Turkey, we were, for most of the time that we lived there, we were the only Black American family, but another Black American family did move in probably about six months before we uh, returned to the States. Mm -hmm. So ra racially, no, not so, not so much diversity, but just in terms of um, socioeconomic backgrounds, um, where others were coming from, like our, our uh, street in our neighborhood in, in Germany uh, was fairly diverse in terms of others, our, our neighbors' professions, um, their socioeconomic backgrounds, mm -hmm. uh, the kind of their, their family histories. And in, um, in Izmir, in Turkey, it was again, fairly mixed because we had a lot of Turkish neighbors. Some were older, some were retired. There were some uh, younger families there um, who lived in our, our cul-de-sac. And then with the American and Canadian families, again, there was kind of a, a pretty mixed nature in terms of their, their actual backgrounds, just not, not racially speaking. And it sounds like you didn't live near a whole lot of Americans when you were abroad. <laughs> Is that true? That's true. Was that weird for you? Did it? I mean, I guess you were so young. It sounds like it, it didn't factor too much, especially as a four-year-old. You probably didn't <laughs> notice. As you got older, did it feel weird at all to not be living near Americans? I d not so much weird. As I did get older, it, it was something that I that, be that became more noticeable. Um, I think especially as at that point, you know, as I got older, I got a little more exposed by, you know, m media. Mm -hmm. um, I think about kind of um, American culture that I hadn't been able to experience firsthand. Mm -hmm. So for me growing, yeah, growing up abroad, I learned, or my idea of what it meant to be an American really was, I learned from my parents, our free, our few trips, whenever we did go on base to go to like the, um, the, the base exchange, the BX or kind of shopping. <laughs> I haven't heard BX in a long time. <laughs> oh, the BX. No, I can still picture that. It's like <laughs> military target. <laughs> I mean, they had everything you needed. They really did. Oh, goodness. The culture shock when we returned to the States and I saw and went into a Walmart for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> well, so besides going on, on base and, and, you know, and going to school, that really, that was my idea of what it meant to be an American. I didn't really have kind of firsthand experiences. Um, and because I was so young, I did feel like I, I, I do feel like I'm a, I like to think of myself as a third culture kid in the sense that I feel like I grew up as a global citizen um, having mm -hmm. been exposed to these different cultures and people, you know, at an early age. So as a military brat, I won't say of course, but for me personally, I did grow up with a very strong sense of, of patriotism, mm -hmm. but it was more so, I think, for the U.S. as an ideal since mm -hmm. I didn't mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Were you curious about American culture? Like, was it something that you were really curious about? Or even as a kid, did you have kind of the presence of mind, I guess, to realize this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to really immerse myself in this culture, we can figure out the American stuff later. And to compound on that, I'm curious, <laughs> what did you think American culture was before you moved back to the United States when it was kind of more of an academic exercise with your parents and the media telling you what American culture was? Right. And when I say media, it was very limited because we did mm. not have TV, we had three channels growing up. My dad was very <laughs> insistent on limiting our, our exposure to media. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we did not get, I think it was AFN, the American Family Network TV that was broadcast over basically like cable from the States to overseas. Mm -hmm. We didn't have that. We had, CNN, <laughs> we had CNN, Eurosport, and one local language channel. So um, that sounds great for a kid. <laughs> In hindsight, sure. At the time, I was, you know, <laughs> annoyed. <laughs> so annoyed. Um, so, kind of my, some of my, aside from, you know, kind of my parents' experiences and learning from them um, and what I learned in school, a lot of the stereotypes for being American that I, I sort of learned came from our, our neighbors. So, it came from you uh, know, our neighbors, our Turkish neighbors. So, a lot of it was sort of the superficial, like, oh, kind of based on re like regions in the United States, like, oh, are all Americans are, are rich, or all Americans are cowboys, or all Americans are surfers, you know, depending on which part of the Yeah, country. rich surfer cowboys. <laughs> so, um, or, or even some of the, you know, kind of, you know, all Americans are, are, are loud and, and just, you know, gregarious, yeah. extroverted, and mm -hmm. sort of those sor sorts of superficial and, and I think kind of shallow stereotypes. Um, I will say it was... Um, I think interesting now, especially as I think about it and look back, to note that 
any those stereotypes always kind of existed in that realm of being American. So when I think about the racial racial stereotypes or the racial component, um, like my German neighbors and, and Turkish neighbors, they they saw my family, they saw us as being American, not necessarily as Black mm. Americans. Mm-hmm. So that's definitely something um, that, I, that that's definitely that shaped my childhood and and that kind of served as a bit of a sh- culture shock mm-hmm. uh, for me when we did return to the, to the States. And to, to Mallory's point, um, I mean, as a kid, did you, did you feel any greater desire to identify more as an American? And alternatively, based on what you just said about the stereotypes that were offered, <laughs> and what I know about you, <laughs> I know that you are not a loud cowboy. <laughs> um, did you feel any kind of um, a- any any conflict within yourself about what you thought an American was supposed to be versus what you were? Not. <sighs> That's a good question. I don't necessarily know that it, not, I think not really. And again, because I don't think there was anyone really around to kind of challenge that. Mm. Um, So even, yeah, like if, no, you're right. I'm not a loud cowboy. (laughs) But do you surf? (laughs) You would blow me over if you told me that you were a surfer. (laughs) Surfer, but I have been surfing. (laughs) Okay. But I think, and I think I kind of recognized those, those stereotypes for what they were and just, and, and, whenever they were brought up, they didn't necessarily, it didn't feel like they were brought up in a very malicious way. It just mm. more of a, you know, just kind of not knowing as much um, maybe about, about the diversity of the United States. Um, so it, it wasn't, it wasn't something that I really took personally. So I, I don't know that I felt conflicted in terms mm-hmm. of trying to, whether I felt conflicted again, not really, because I don't think there was anyone around to really, to really challenge um my identity or, or, Mm -hmm. uh, or my, my feelings on it. You were who you were and where you were. Yeah. That works. (laughs) So let's talk about when you weren't where you were anymore. So you moved to the U S at some (laughs) point in your life (laughs) around the age of 12, right? Yes. Yes. What was that like? Oh my goodness. (laughs) (laughs) So we moved back. It was, I was um, around late, late fall, early, early winter of 99. So kind of right in time for the, the Y2K fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it was one, I think part, part of it was to say I came back kind of in time for to finish up middle school, which I don't know, but um, it seems like middle school wasn't a great experience for a lot of people. <laughs> Definitely wasn't, wasn't too great for me just in terms of dealing with the, the culture shock. Um, I think first and foremost, I felt a really deep kind of lack of community moving back here. And again, mm-hmm. coming from, I think this is more so the the military background than necessarily being abroad, but, you know, we had host families abroad whenever we moved to a different country. Mm-hmm. Um, and just like, it was, that was just very much an integrated part of moving and transitioning. And so mm-hmm. when we moved back, we, my family's all in Colorado, so we moved back here. Mm. Um, you know, of course I had family, you know, back here that I was like, yay, I get to, I get to actually get to know these people. Mm-hmm. You know, my family kind of helped us integrate, but it wasn't that same type of um, kind of welcome wagon or that same type of transition mm-hmm. that I had been used to. So that was difficult. Um, little things, just like the la- the landscape, um, seeing fast food everywhere. I mean, my yeah. life, that was mind blowing to me. And like I said, um, uh, you know, seeing and going into my first Walmart and, you know, kind of the little things like that. But um, mm-hmm. the bigger so, thing really was learning kind of that firsthand about my identity as, you know, as a Black American. Um, you know, as I mentioned abroad, it was kind of dealing with the stereotypes of, you know, just Americans in general. And I was always seen as being an American, not a Black American. And so when we moved back here, um, I then kind of learned firsthand some of the stereotypes that you know unfortunately are still held against black americans you know i had teachers who assumed that i was poor um or that i was academically behind when i had always been in gifted and talented programs uh, since the Mm -hmm. first grade or assumed that i came from a broken home with absolutely no basis for those assumptions um i started hearing those you know micro aggressive comments Mm -hmm. on like oh you're so articulate and i'm thinking okay (laughs) 
why wouldn't I be? Why? <laughs> uh-huh. uh, with that subtext being that I'm not supposed to be, or I'm not expected mm-hmm. to be. And just you know, several of you know, several of those other you know, similar types of comments or or actions um, that aren't unique or new, but to me they were. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was kind of the biggest transition. You know, the big, the big that was the, you know, the huge culture shock that I that I faced um, coming back to the states. How did you deal with those microaggressions as someone who is still young, but hadn't been dealing with them, you know, since you were a baby or since you were a very, a very young person as, you know, a 12, 13, 14 year old person, how did you deal with those microaggressions knowing that they didn't have anything to do with who you actually were? So thankfully, and I, I give, you know, I, I'm so grateful for my parents, for, for both of them. And I think particularly my dad, just because that's, um, he had a, his, his educational experience kind of, um, reflected mine a little bit, or I guess my educational experience to a certain extent reflected his, mm-hmm. um, he, both my parents, again, were huge supports for me. And I do think that they did their best before we came back to the States to try to prepare me for that. Um, again, it was more of an, in an academic sense than that firsthand experience. Um, but, you know, growing up, my dad insisted, you know, we, <laughs> we watched Roots, including the Christmas special, which not many people <laughs> know about. Uh, you know, we watched Roots pretty much on an annual basis. We also watched a PBS special on civil rights movement, Eyes on the Prize. That was annual viewing uh, for me and my family growing up. Ken Burns' Civil War documentary set. My, uh, my dad, I don't know how he found this, but he actually found this board game called Black Americans of Achievement, which, uh, <laughs> wow. <that's- laughs> so I had a very <laughs> awesome. What was the goal of the board game? Basically like a, like trivial pursuit, but just with African American. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, um, I mean, a great, a great game, a great, you know, learning, you know, a great educational tool, a great learning tool. And then yeah. also just so many books so much reading that's all you know that's been a part of my um of my upbringing and having both of my parents you know not just you know handing me books and saying you know read this you know as part of your history and you know your your background um but sitting down with with me to go over you know to go over um these books and to try to gain that that understanding that self-awareness and that pride in in who I am and and who we are um Mm -hmm. as a family and so I think having that is kind of my foundation and uh, my, so my armor in a sort of sense um, and having been insulated from some of these, these microaggressions, these actions mm-hmm. uh, from, from an earlier age, I think helped me, but it was still difficult. Um, it was still difficult. And so mm-hmm. I leaned on my, I leaned on my parents a lot um, mm-hmm. throughout, throughout that time. Um, and like I said, I, I'm just glad and very, for- I'm very fortunate that I wasn't introduced to this at a younger age. And didn't have as much time to internalize some of these comments um, because it's like death by a thousand paper cuts. It mm-hmm. wears on you over time. Yeah. So I feel like I'm I'm privileged because that clock didn't start for me until you know 12 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's not. I mean, it's still it, it, it was still just a very you know infuriating um, yeah and just disappointing and disheartening uh, you know position to be placed in. I, I do think kind of going back, I do think I had a fairly, even after my parents had kind of explained the academic sense and, you know, understanding the history in my mind, I think it was still very much history. I don't think I quite understood, you know, I thought my parents were just teaching me that this mm-hmm. is where it came from. This is how it used to be. I don't think mm-hmm. I quite understood that they were preparing me at that time, um, you know, for, for what I would probably have to face. Um, but I'm glad that they did because it, it did help. I do think that that helped me um, Mm -hmm. moving forward. Yeah. So you're a 12 year old person. You move back to the United States, you get through middle school and high school. I can affirm for you that middle school is not a good experience for anyone, (laughs) but it sounds like you had an extremely unique uh, experience of middle school. So you get through high school, you go to college. Where did you go to college? I went to Pomona College in Southern California. What was that like? And why did you choose Southern California? To surf, obviously. <laughs> okay, fair. <laughs> you went to Pomona College to surf. <laughs> no, I mean, I absolutely won. And um, oh, my goodness. So I 
I've, I've always been drawn, you know, of course, I mean, it's California. Um, mm -hmm. I was drawn, I did a lot of schools, you know, in California. And I think part of it was, yeah, you know, it's this kind of dream state, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't want to go and kind of, you know, be close to the water. We used to live across the street from the beach when we were uh, living in Turkey. And so I did miss um, uh. the water. So, and the East Coast seemed too cold and too far. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is fair. Parents, yeah. <laughs> so I was looking at, at California and this was also, you know, when we, um, the kind of the, the time to poke a little bit of fun here when it seemed like um, everyone moving to Colorado at that point was only from California or Texas. <laughs> so I might as well see um, kind of what they're leaving behind. Mm -hmm. uh, I was drawn to the Claremont Colleges. It's a consortium of five undergraduate um, colleges and one graduate university that all share kind of a their own all share contiguous campuses and they share mm -hmm. a lot of resources and so for me it kind of felt like the best of both worlds in the sense that the college itself um, is pretty small you know, um, small liberal arts colleges but you still get the benefits mm -hmm. of the resources that you would find at a larger university yeah and so that was kind of what what drew me and I did feel that I, I fit best with Pomona College and fortunate enough to to get in so it's an extremely well thought strategy which is is so characteristic of you um, so you go to Pomona College um what was college like for you I had it was it was a lot of fun I um I had a wonderful experience in in college I got to um I think definitely put my self out there in a lot of different ways uh in high school um, I went to a predominantly white private high school here in, uh, mm. in the Denver metro area. And it, that was, I, I got a great education, um, but socially I didn't feel that there were, I don't want to say necessarily as many opportunities, but I did struggle there socially. And so mm. for me getting to college really was sort of my, that was where I was able to kind of um, really grow and, and expand both academically and socially. Um, so it was just, yeah, it was a great experience. I definitely try to take as advantage of as many different, you know, things as I could as possible, whether it was mm -hmm. from the courses, um, being a liberal arts college, you know, there, I was encouraged to, you know, take courses outside of my major mm -hmm. and really have all of that, that exploration, which I, I definitely did. My transcript is really kind of a hodgepodge <laughs> of, <laughs> of, uh, just, you know, taking courses that, I, that just sounded interesting. Yeah. Um, and the same with the, my extracurricular activities. Um, I was involved with the student newspaper. I was um, involved with our uh, women's union and was later the head of our women's union. Um, was involved with, I did a lot of internships. Um, I also uh, took a few jobs while I was on campus. And so it was really just a great, great opportunity and just a lot of fun. So at what point did you decide you wanted to go to law school? So I, I love, and I used, I, I joke, I loved my undergraduate experience so much that I stayed on for a few years as an admissions <laughs> counselor. Um, I was also very involved, you know, in admissions as a student. I was the, the, and the tour guide, one of the, the tour guides walking back <laughs> that, that you see on campuses. And so um, I, I got into college admissions and really my, my, what led me on my path to law school was a a few things. So one, during my senior year um, in college, the big one of the, you know, the big news you know, topics on campus was our dining hall workers attempt to unionize. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, you know, huge um, for our campus community. And the college ended up hiring an outside firm to represent them in the negotiations. And that was kind of, for me, I was like, wait a minute, we're, oh, huh colleges or, or clients, you know, it was something that was like, well, now that I think of it, duh, but <laughs> the thing that I really thought, you know, thought of before is colleges, you know, needing to hire, um, you know, hire for um, counsel, and especially mm -hmm. because the, the college didn't have its own general counsel, and I will note that it was also a particular note to me, um, so let me explain a little bit about with the consortium, there are sort of rivalries within the consortium, and so Pomona and uh, Pitzer College, they combined together to form, you know, our sports team. Mm -hmm. And then the three other colleges, uh, Claremont McKenna, Harvey Mudd, and Scripps, they together form our rivals. Um, but Pomona and Claremont McKenna enjoy a, you know, a fun rivalry. And so I learned that one of the attorneys that was, uh, that worked for the firm that was representing Pomona in the negotiations was from Claremont McKenna. So that kind of sparked a little bit of competitive mm -hmm. thinking, wait a minute. <laughs> So someone's going to, you know, represent the, you know, Pomona College. It should be someone, you know. Uh, <laughs> you're like, that should be me. 
yeah, so a little, little bit of competitiveness there, but um, that was, that's something that kind of got me thinking about, um, you know, institutions as, as clients, as needing legal representation. And then the other um, big uh, thing that led me to, to law school was the uh, Fisher v. University of Texas case on um, admissions, the role of race in admissions mm. affirmative action. And again, working in admissions, we had a lot of conversations yeah. about this, about the case as it was working its way through, I think at this point, um, it was still in the Fifth Circuit, uh, but, um, but working its way up to the Supreme Court. And so we talked about the case, we talked about you know, our own practices. And so out of the kind of those conversations, um, just again, really thinking about what, what is the institution as you know, an institution of higher education or institution of education period, you know, what are its, its needs, not just for compliance, um, but also sort of what's been the role of institutions to transform and sort of kind of you know, um, lead the way in setting, you know, educational policy um, and that sort of thing. And so, you know, I knew about Brown v. Board of Education and mm -hmm. Marshall and Constance Baker Motley, but I started to think about who are the attorneys who represented the Topeka Board of Education. Like, mm -hmm. um, so I, I did go to law school intending to practice school law, or at least intending to study uh, the practice of school law. Um, what else made you interested in a pretty specific area of law and education law? So I think those, those, you know, those, those cases, I think in particular, were interested me in the legal part of it. But I've always been deeply passionate about education. Um, that's something, again, my, my family, my parents instilled, you know, that deep sense of education as a value um, in me in a, at, a, at a very early age. As a, and that's also an extended va uh, family value that we have. And I think also in my experience as an admissions officer, I really just started to see some of the barriers to, act, to accessing um, higher education, at least. I remember one of... Um, as an admissions counselor, I also oversaw our tour guide program. And mm -hmm. one of the um, groups that requested a tour on our campus was a, uh, a group of primarily foster youth, foster mm -hmm. youth. And they were older, you know, they had a great visit on campus. But I remember after they left, I was just so, I think, disheartened because they were at a point where they weren't necessarily competitive app, you know, applicants for the college. Mm -hmm. um, and they were, you know, they were mostly juniors or actually, actually they were mostly seniors. And so it was already kind of at a point where I, I started thinking what could have been done sooner so that they could have been, you know, more better, better in a better position, um, you know, to be more competitive to apply to a place like, like Pomona um, or places like Pomona. And so that, that piece of that access um, is once you think about the higher, higher education, I think that's one thing, but without a strong foundation, you know, access to high quality public education, uh, public, you know, K through 12 and particularly public K through 12 education, that really does limit your opportunities moving forward. And so I became very interested and invested in thinking of what can I do to help on that front end to, you know, to prepare students better, all students to give them that strong foundation so that they have, again, they have those opportunities so that they're better prepared to do whatever they want once they get to, to that point, but mm -hmm. we have to get them there first. Um, so that's the, the edge of the cases, the, you know, those, my experiences with the cases that were, were ongoing at that time is what made me think maybe the law is a good way to, um, to, to use a good vehicle for this interest in education. So that's so. How have you gone about that? Tell us about what you do now. Uh, so what I do now is I uh, work for the Colorado Association of School Boards, and I get to work with um, a number. In my current role, I get to provide legal information and guidance, not direct counsel, um, but legal information and guidance to our member school boards. So I get to work with school leaders across the state. Um, which mm -hmm. is very exciting and it's an amazing opportunity that I'm very grateful for. Um, other opportunities for school attorneys exist in you know, in-house positions with school districts or outside mm -hmm. council firms that specialize in school law or representing individual students as well as positions within state and federal educational departments and agencies. Um, but I like my role because of the number of, of, um, of school board members, of school leaders, directors that I'm able to 
uh, speak with on a on a daily basis if they're as their members as part of their membership with CASB. And do you feel like you're having the opportunity now to do what you hoped you would do, which is um, foster the ability for younger people to have a- greater access to education? I think absolutely. Um, every I mean, one, I'm working with people who are passionate about children education in their communities. Um, which even in these, especially this past year, has kind of been that that lifeline, that support line for me to work with with such you know people who share that passion. Um, and I think every day presents those challenges on these questions that lead to I think strengthening our our public schools, ensuring that they're fulfilling their missions and their values, and that they're meeting their students' needs. And so. I mean, I get to research a broad range of topics from First Amendment free speech issues for students and staff, um, facilities and construction law. So we've been just thinking about making sure that the buildings that our children, that our students are, are learning in, if they're in person, um, or when they go back to being in person, which, you know, hopefully soon, but um, things like, like that, personnel, employment law issues, civil rights mm-hmm. and anti-discrimination um, issues, contract. And so, I mean, anything that, if, that affects a school, I mean, you name it, we we're there, like we, we provide information and guidance on it. And I think mm-hmm. to go back to when I was in law school, I clerked for a school law firm. And I think one of the most fulfilling projects that I was able to work on at that point was on transgender student um, guidance and transgender mm-hmm. student guidance. And this was before the uh, Obama administration had come out with its transgender student guidance, which has since been withdrawn. Um, but really being able to craft you know, information at that point that wasn't necessarily, there, there wasn't as much of a legal landscape for it. So really being able to um, kind of be a, a leader in, in coming up with, uh, with policies and guidelines for supporting transgender students before essentially the federal government said, this is what you have to do. And then later mm-hmm. said, no, you don't. Um, so that was something that was very, very meaningful um, for me. And I, I took education law in law school, and I really thought we were just going to learn about school stuff, and I didn't know what school stuff was. Uh-huh. Um, and then I got there, and I realized that there are so many areas, like you're saying. You know, there was the criminal piece and searches, and then there was First Amendment stuff. Like, there's literally every area of law has a piece of that education law, which I thought was just fascinating. What is your favorite area within education law um, that you've really, really enjoyed working in? I do think that I'm particularly drawn to two issues that impact student rights. And so, like I mentioned, that the transgender student rights, um, the transgender students guidance that we came out with when I, um, at the firm that I used to clerk for, that that work was very meaningful. And even thinking, working through, um, especially like free speech, First Amendment issues um, has also been very challenging at times, but but also, you know, very meaningful. And I think I'm particularly drawn to, you know, the issues that, that affect student rights. Um, because I, I think, essentially, I think at the core, I think I see them essentially as, as civil rights. I think there's, and I think that's, and I think that it's also because it's still an evolving landscape. I mean, there's a lot of areas of law that are, that are currently evolving, but I think particularly with student rights, um, I think we're in a position now where we're seeing that that evolution moving on a more rapid scale, and it is one exciting to be, you know, to feel like I'm a part of it um, in this time. Uh, but also seeing the the importance of it, and I think it, working through student issues, it's a great way also to not only educate students but to kind of get them involved if they're seeing themselves reflected in, you know, these current you know changes in in policy. Mm-hmm. Um, not, yes, I, so I think that's, I think yeah, issues that affect student rights are, are probably my favorite. Can you, can you tell us anything about challenges you've had this year being a very unique year for, for schooling overall? Oh goodness. Who, who can't share a challenge? <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, absolutely. You know, with the pandemic, our members have absolutely faced difficulties and challenges, you know, struggles this year with closing schools in the spring, um, the exposure of multiple inequities. So, you know, parts of the state that have limited or no Wi-Fi or broadband access, there are 178 school districts in Colorado, and most of them are rural. Mm. Uh, and so that has been a huge, um, 
a huge hurdle, a huge barrier for a lot of our member districts. Um, students who have parents that can work from home and help them learn remotely um, versus those that, that don't, or mm -hmm. students who rely on schools for meals and other services. I remember um, not just from my work with, with CASB, but even when I saw, you know, the, the news, the articles, um, when schools, you know, closed in the spring, um, or closed, the buildings closed in the springs, schools were still, you know, going on, um, but feeding students was one of the leading, you know, articles, you know, the, the, the leading topics that I kept seeing over and, and over, um, so that's been, you know, a huge difficulty for a lot of our districts to you know, to, they prioritized it to, to keep it up and a lot of them are it's still ongoing in terms of providing those meals and other services to students um to, considering how do you deliver special education services if you're mm. remote mm -hmm. um, that's been a huge issue uh, that we've been working through you know the list really goes on um trying to plan ahead for reopening um and then having plans in place if the school or if certain groups of students and or teachers or cohorts if they need to quarantine mm -hmm. or do that and managing kind of all of this with sometimes mixed messaging from you know other state or federal offices that's that's yeah. been, a lot. It's been quite the balancing act Ooh, wow <laughs> yeah that's a that full plate sounds challenging um have you i don't know do you feel like you've been able to address those issues successfully or are there are there issues that are still kind of hanging that that schools are really struggling to resolve i mean i th well for the for the technical issues like when it comes to like, limited access to wi-fi right. or, or problem um you know one of the things that we're doing we do have an advocacy arm you know with with casb and so you know supporting efforts to you know to um to increase you know the connectivity throughout the state you know it really is we're seeing that it's an essential need mm -hmm. um it's not really a, a privilege anymore at this point um and so supporting efforts to to increase and to promote the the connectivity is something that we're um, that we're doing both on the state and the federal level um, in terms and again you know supporting the the services for for students so they continue to get the the services that they need whether they are in person or remote or you know engaged in a, in a hybrid program um, and so that we I do think that we are successful in staying on top of the the ever growing list of of um, needs and challenges that our districts are facing, um, whether we'll be successful in you know mitigating all of those needs, I think is is yet to be seen. But um, I think we're aware of all of these issues and these challenges, and are are working to to find solutions for them. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So as we come up on our last couple of minutes here, let's move on to who you're going to be. So what's next for you? What's your plan for the future? You know, well, both professionally and, you know, kind of personally, I, I want to establish a deeper sense of community or establish myself within communities. Um, you know, pre-COVID, you know, I had mm. plans to start, you know, attending bar committee meetings. I, I, when I've got, you know me, I've got my lists and I have uh -huh. my, my, <laughs> my checklists, um, you know, engaged in more events. I was previously involved with the Lawyers and Schools Committee. Um, I volunteered to help with the state high school mock trial tournament, and I was interested in helping to build uh, mock trial teams in underrepresented schools. I'm not mm. quite sure the status of, of that programming at this point, but that's something that I would hope to get back into. Mm -hmm. um, I'm currently a member of the CBA, the, the DBA and the CWBA, the Colorado Women's Bar Association, and it reminds me that I do need to renew my membership in the same <laughs> <case. laughs> Um, you know, I'm not currently as, as involved as I would like to be, but increasing my engagement was one of my professional goals for uh, mm. for this year. And I, I plan to take advantage of as many opportunities for engagement and connection um, that each association provides as soon as I feel, you know, safe and comfortable doing so. Yeah. Um, or, as, or as soon as my Zoom meeting schedule kind of tapers <laughs> down. That's uh, <laughs> so I can participate electronically. Um, I will say, though, that I, uh, I used to try to make the brown bag CLE presentations in, in person before all of this, but it has been easier to, to attend virtually. Mm. So that's been helpful and it's given kind of a small sense of, of normalcy for me mm -hmm. um, but I think also just like I said I, I spent you know 10 years you know, almost 10 years exactly um, 10 years away from Colorado for, for undergrad and then working in law school and so Denver's changed mm -hmm. a lot <laughs> since <laughs> I was gone <laughs> um, and it's one of those things where you know moving around as a kid helped make me more adaptable and adjustable 
and, you know, gave me great opportunities, but I'm really looking forward to, you know, putting down roots and being someplace for more than seven years, which is my current method for living someplace. So I'm, I'm on years. Board. When was seven years? That was in, in California. So four years uh-huh. for undergrad and then the three years until I moved to Texas for law school. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, did you enjoy law school? I think enjoy is a strong. <laughs> Darn. I was really hoping you were going to be the one. <laughs> we keep asking. Yeah, we none of our waiting. interviewees have actually enjoyed law school. <laughs> did I enjoy one out? No. Um, <laughs> did, did I enjoy my, you know, my second and third years? Yes, I did. So, so I guess overall, yes, I did enjoy law school. Um, but I think most of that was because of my, I was in my clinical experience. I took the children's rights clinic. Hmm. That was a, an amazing experience and definitely yeah. to both my, my current you know, role at CASB, but also my previous practice as a guardian ad litem. Um, so that was something mm-hmm. that was definitely, you know, a, a productive um, and just great practical, hands-on practical experience for me. Um, being able to take, and I think also my advanced legal research and writing classes, which I don't know how many people say that, but um, <laughs> I love my legal writing class. <laughs> I also love my, my legal writing classes. I took, that's why I took all of them. That's why I took <laughs> all the ones that were, that were offered um, throughout, throughout law school. And they're also, they've also been the ones that again, have been kind of the most, had the most direct relevance on my current practice. Uh, I should have taken more. <laughs> I got through one and I don't think they would have let me oh. <laughs> take any more. They're like, we got you through the one. You're done. <laughs> no more for you. <laughs> well, um, as our last question, I would like to ask you, what advice do you have for law students or young lawyers who are coming out into the legal world and trying to find themselves, figure out what they're supposed to be doing? I think for current students, I would definitely encourage them to get as much practical experience as they can, whether it's through clinical opportunities, um, Mm -hmm. internships, if they're able to take advantage of those, clerkships, but really finding um, ways to get that practical experience. Because I I think that really, you know, getting the academic foundation is is key, is is Mm -hmm. important. But I also think getting that practical experience is what's going to help them decide really what do you want to do from the day to day after you graduate? Um, mm-hmm. Where you want to focus your time and your efforts um, and your advocacy. And if for yeah. students who are thinking about going to law school, I would encourage them to try to do that before they get to law school. <laughs> <laughs> that might help uh, help narrow down a lot of um, a lot of fields or areas of interest for them and help them to, you know determine whether law school is the, is going to be the right vehicle or the yeah. appropriate vehicle um, for them to achieve what they. Uh, what they want. I think given the, uh, well, the current state of things and, and with the economy and the legal market, I don't, um, I remember when I, you know, was applying to law school, it was still sort of the advice of, you know, oh, if you don't know what you, you know, it was kind of, law school was still sort of peddled, or at least when I was an undergrad is, you know, you don't know what, don't know what you want to do, go to law school. I don't think oh my that's- my God. Is that like, you don't know what you want to major in in college, major in psychology? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's helpful. Um, oh, <laughs> nope. Too expensive for you to, to go on a loan. Yeah. Trip. Yeah. If it was free, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, getting getting that experience. And I think also um, for current students or, or um, recent graduates, and then I, understanding that you know, the market may be tough, but also looking into pro bono opportunities. Mm. One, aside from being a great way to, you know, to give back, um, it's also a great way to get you know, connected with the legal community. Yeah. That you're invested in, you're you're committed, um, and it could lead to future opportunities. And so, again, I say that understanding that you know not everyone is in a position where they feel that they're able to take on um, those type of opportunities. They might need to start paying back those loans. Mm-hmm. Um, but <laughs> I do think that that's something to to look into again. Just really getting as much as much practical experience as possible. Yeah. And I hope that we have some pre-law students hearing this because that's excellent advice. Um, So we are out of time, but thank you so, so much for talking with us today, for letting us interview you, for letting us talk to you about uh, everything (laughs) you've ever experienced. Um, We really appreciate your time and Yeah, this has been awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. 
Absolutely. Thank you both. This has been Our Voices. For more information on today's guest or to get involved, please check out the CBA podcast page at cobar.org slash podcast. That's C-O-B-A-R dot org slash podcast. This podcast series was created by members of the Colorado and Denver Bar Associations. Our Voices is a collaborative effort of the EDI Joint Steering Committee messaging team, including Mallory Rebel, Linda Moss, Bonnie Schreiner, Mallory Hasbrook, Mo Watson, Mario Trimble, Courtney Holm, and Emmy Lopez, with our CBA Communications Team Director, Heather Folker, and Manager, Charles McGarvey. Our recording engineer is Rick Pontelion of Lionsbridge Recording. Our producer and editor is Courtney Holm, with theme and introduction by Mario Trimble. This podcast is made possible because of the support of the Colorado and Denver Bar Associations. On behalf of all of us, thanks for listening to Our Voices. Thank you.